welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove. I'm alone in studio, but I'll soon be talking to Brian Sharetta about all things U.S. men's national team, from the senior roster to the U23s all the way to the U17s. If the U.S. national team is your thing, may I also recommend listening to our spin-off podcast, Soccer 101, where the most recent episode is Taylor and I selecting our all-time U.S. men's national team starting eleven. Now, it's actually a great time to subscribe to Soccer 101 because there's a new episode publishing late Tuesday afternoon in which we outline the strengths and weaknesses of various football formations. So please go search for Soccer 101 in your podcast player. You'll see the nice orange logo. Hit subscribe and then please give it a listen. Before we talk to Brian, today's Total Soccer Show is sponsored by Enclosed. If you're looking for a gift for your significant other, and if you've always wanted that gift to be lingerie, but you were too scared to go into a store, then Enclosed is here to help. Enclosed is a female-owned business specializing in high-end lingerie. And we mean high-end, both in the quality of the product and the customer service. Because Enclosed comes with a size guarantee, which means you can't get it wrong. You can't get the wrong size. Enclosed does the work and you get the credit for upscale gifts that will be delivered every month and of course we have an offer for you if you go to enclosed.gifts g-i-f-t-s and enter the code total soccer that's all one word total soccer at enclosed.gifts you'll get 35 dollars off any multi-month order thank you to enclosed for sponsoring today's show now let's talk some u.s men's national team Brian Shiretta, welcome back to the Total Soccer Show, and thank you, thank you for taking the time to make an appearance. Oh, anytime. I always love being on. So, I actually originally wanted to talk to you about the U23s because I feel like you're one of the few people paying attention to Jason Christ and the U23s and the preparations for Olympic qualification. Mm-hmm. But 30 minutes before our scheduled phone call, <laughs> US Soccer released the sort of final-ish. 23-man roster for the upcoming CONCACAF Nations League game against Canada. Um, No Christian Pulisic, no Michael Bradley. And then a follow-up tweet is where I saw it, where US Soccer said, uh, we're evaluating Christian Pulisic, he had that hip injury against Chelsea, and we're not sure if he'll join the squad or not. What do you make of all that, Brian? I mean, it's a lot to take in. I mean, the roster's, I mean, at this point in the game, it's it's not... It's not too unexpected. I mean, it, it, it's not as glamorous as everyone would like. And, yeah. Um, there wasn't there wasn't the shakeups. I think everyone was liking after the disappointing um, uh, last couple of windows. But you know, this is where we are as a national team. Look, I'm not. I'm one of the ones who will be. I was very critical of the style, the system, of the way the team plays. Um, but if you want to, but I don't see any like magic bullets out there that are going to rescue this team. Um, I'm not one of these one people that think that there's this long list of people that should be getting called up that are denied, uh, that are not getting called up. I mean, look, if it was up to me, I think Dwayne Holmes and Matt Miazga should be on this team. Uh, but other than that, you know, like I think everyone, you know, the guys who are at the 23s belong there, and uh, the guys who are at the 20s. I mean, they're, 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 there's no camp going on right now, but you know that that you know we kind of know the key players there. I think that this is just the product of what I've been saying for years and working through a, a generational gap. Um, it's a, I mean, a, f- a five, six year generational gap is an awful thing. And uh, it takes a long time to churn through that. There's no quick fixes or, or anything. So um, you, you know, regarding pool sick, you know, it, 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 it's too bad. And because even before this, win, I mean, he didn't play well against Canada. No one did. Uh, but yeah. he's play- But that was before he hit his stride right now. Um, Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you, you want to see – I mean, he, what he's doing is unprecedented. And you want to see if that could carry over to the full national team because he wasn't playing like this in the last couple windows. So uh, it's, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate. And, you know, I guess they're getting some – you know, even, even if he does arrive with the team, it certainly doesn't sound like he'll be at 100%. That's the worrying thing, right, is even if we do get Christian Pulisic, we're not necessarily getting the Pulisic that didn't have the hip injury <laughs> sustained yes. in the game. I mean, I don't know Palace. anything more than you know, I mean, about it uh, in terms of this injury uh, and the severity and – and and of it but like yeah you want to be able to see hey this is daryl jumping in with an update after my conversation with brian um there's been a statement uh from greg berhalter uh greg berhalter told the media that quote 
Christian is officially at this stage ruled out. We just got that information. This was a collaborative decision with the club. Those two sentences kind of contradict each other. Um, He goes on, looking after the best interest of the player. These decisions are always difficult because this group and the coaching staff want nothing more than to have Christian here, but it was a risk we weren't willing to take at this time. Unquote. So Christian Pulisic officially not on the US men's national team roster for the games against Canada and Cuba. And I think there's just a general frustration of the fact that like the US hasn't been able to roll out there with some of its best players too. I mean, there's always there's been uh, you know a lot of injuries that have hurt this team. You know, obviously Tyler Adams has been gone for quite some time. And so everyone wants to see like, you know, something closer to the A squad. You know, Josie Altador, I know he played a little bit at the end of the MLS Cup, but uh, but that was know, probably not, as long as he could manage, right? Which is yeah, the reason he only played he that many. Too. So he's not in, he's not in particularly good shape either. And you know, you want you want all the best players out there. And um, right now they're just trying to muddle through it. And 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 I'm you know, unfortunately, I'm uh, the tactics and the style with for Borhalter. You know that that's a different that's a different problem than the than the than the roster selection. Let's put it that way. Is there a possibility? You already said that you're not you're not a big fan of trying to play this this uh, positional play possession style soccer. But is there a possibility Ooh. that with the big names out, maybe this could be a time for the system to shine? No, uh, no? I don't <laughs> think that. I mean, I I think that they're. They're, 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 they seem to be rolling with this system regardless of who's you know playing and who's not. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, look, it, it's now you have Morales in that in that in that you know, and the problem is too is like all these midfielders are redundant. Like they're all, how should we say it? Like they all quasi number eights. Like yeah. no one's really like a defined number six, which is what I've been arguing for a long time. They need a real defensive minded physical presence in that sixth role. And, you know, behind Tyler Adams, there really hasn't been anybody. Uh, yeah, you know, they used to have these players all the time. Uh, you know, Kyle Beckerman before that, you know, Mastroni and Armas and all these players. And now it's a rarity. And I think the 17 struggled with that. I think that, the, you know, we've seen that at the youth play and, and now it's uh, without Adams there and it's not there. And, you know, Alfredo Morales might fill in in that role, but he's more of an eight. They're all number eights that yeah. are kind of quasi. They're all guys who lack fluid positions, and um, and now they all have to manage their way through both the ten, the six, and the eight positions. And and yeah, and, and it goes back to the Peralta's tactics. I think he's just kind of set on having like uh, these roles, and um, and we'll we'll see. You know how you know if. if if there are any adjustments right now um, heading into this camp, but it's been it's been kind of a it hasn't worked very well. I think the team is not, no one's really played up to the sum of their parts, not just pool of sick or the stars, but you know, of the team, but like really anybody, no one's, no one can really walk away saying like, I am playing as well uh, for the national team as I am for my club uh, or as I have been playing for my club at, at least at some point this year. So with no Michael Bradley, um, he apparently sustained an ankle injury um, in MLS cup. Uh, Jackson Yule and Will Trapp both make the roster. They seem to be, the players who fill that, I want to call it a number six role, but it's very much more like a, a tempo setting passing midfielder role, right? Than a, than a destroyer defensive midfielder role. That, that yeah. You're talking I mean, no, those guys are physical. I think Jackson's a little bit more creative and dynamic. Um, I mean, if you notice, I wonder if I do, you know, we don't know this yet. Uh, we won't know until there's been a press conference, but it'd be interesting to see, and he might not admit to it, but I don't know if, I'm not completely convinced Trap would have made this team had Bradley made it. I mean, yeah. everyone thinks like Trap is like, uh, you know, like such a ironclad call up. I mean, I, I kind of think he's been going away. Um, yeah, he's been making but, the roster, but not the field. Yeah, well, he's played one out of the last seven games for the national team. I mean, that's not a lot. And then when you look at where he was and where he has been, uh, it, it's it's fading out. Um, yeah. And but you wonder if he's going to kind of have to rely on him because now Adams and Bradley aren't there, but. Hence, you know, now when you start looking at Canada and they have the and they have a lot more physical players, you know, they they can they can really be a, be a nightmare for a number six um, uh, in that role, you know, to defend against. Uh, I, you don't know if Trap has that kind of a you know physical guts. I mean, I, I'm looking. For, I'm happy that Morales is there, but this kind of shows you that there's just not a lot of players up and down the system. I like Hassani Dodson with the U23s, and hopefully. But he's not ready yet. I just, I you know, you hope he will be in in, yeah. in the coming years. But, uh, but yeah, it's um, you know, the, you need some kind of physical uh, defensive presence right now because, you know, a, 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 opponents have been 
having a pretty easy time going up the middle of the field with the U.S. team. So if you were um, Greg Berhalter and you were determined to you know, play the same sort of system, who would you choose in that, essentially we'll call it like the Michael Bradley position? Like, Would you go Yule or Trap, or would you get Morales or McKenney or someone else to shift over yeah. and do it? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd have McKenney in the midfield in kind of like an eight um, role. Uh, you know, I, I would rate him like Morales, Yule, Trap in that order. I like, um, you know, I like Jackson Yule. I just don't think physically he's been tested. Um, yeah. You know, I think I think he's. Be- I mean, I think at some point he's going to drop down in 2020 to the um, to the U23s because uh, they're going to be. I, th- I mean, I, I'm a believer in the U23s. We're going to get to it, I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, you know, I think that that's a that's an important springboard, and the Olympics is is something U.S. soccer has to look at critically because it can get him some big PR. But look, that's another that's another topic. I think um, Ewell is uh, Ewell's a good player. He hasn't he's shown well. Um, but uh, you know, uh, you know, when these games become physical. Uh, man, I, you know, the U.S. needs that kind of a presence. I think that's what helped, um, uh, you know, going back to the Klinsman era, you know, things started to work better for Klinsman when Kyle Beckerman was went in with Michael Bradley and, yeah. and, uh, and, and uh, Jermaine Jones. Like, you, you, the, the importance of having those defensive-minded number sixes is something that I think all, you know, U.S. managers eventually, you know, you know start to embrace and um so we just uh, we're waiting for better to get there like every other US yeah, I mean, manager we has. Are, but at the same point you know I, I i'm kind of of the belief i know adams had one appearance at right back uh i i think eventually he will settle back into that center defensive midfield position but you know like i said there's you start there's not enough people who play that position naturally uh morales yeah i think he could have a pretty easy time making that transition but still that's not where he plays for fortuna so how about uh, Zach Steffen? What do you make of that situation where he wasn't named to the roster, um, uh, suffering from knee tendonitis, but then he played for Dusseldorf uh, this past weekend? I mean, it is what it is. I, 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 don't, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, um, you know, uh, I know everyone's – it's not a happy time where we, among U.S. fans right now, and I think there's a lot of things that – you know, any kind of negative news frustrates them, and and, yeah. and you understand it too because there hasn't been good news for the, around the program in years, literally years. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, it's kind of become a, a thing of frustration. But same point, we know how tendonitis is. Like, you, you, there's only there's the, the way to cure it is to rest it, and you need to rest it. And um, and you know, if he could just play one more day for Fortuna, I mean, this is a club that needs its goalkeepers it's needs it's you know it's going to be in a relegation fight and zach is going to be a huge part of keeping him out of the relegation zone and um and who knows if he stays with the club for another loan next year i mean uh, we'll, we'll have that's another thing but um this is his first year in, in, in a top european league um why do, you, know, you don't want to do anything that jeopardizes the, the good standing he is in with his club and the good performances he's had um and uh and i'm sure he could you know if these were world cup qualifiers uh, you know, maybe that's a different question um, whether or yeah. not he plays through this. It's kind but of, this is not a world. This is the nation's league. Um, it's, it's weird, right? It occupies this weird middle ground between friendly and World Cup qualifier, where it's it's yeah, more exactly. important than friendly, you know, but not enough to risk your knee health. Yeah, and, and you know, and this is a guy that potentially, if the U.S. qualifies for the Olympics, maybe he's an overager um, mm-hmm. exception, and and because uh, they always go to a goalkeeper for an overage exception and maybe you want to stay in good graces with clubs you know there's a lot of different politics behind the scenes and um you know and and on top of it I, you know guzan's older but he's still a capable backup i don't think he's you know you know if he's the one out there determining whether or not you win and lost lose to canada at home uh you have bigger problems to worry about um than uh you know than you know, oh man, I wish our, we, didn't, we didn't have the right goalkeeper in place. I mean, the problems are much deeper than that. Yeah, I so think, I, yeah, I'm with you. I don't think it's such a big deal. I think maybe it was just handled a little badly by US Soccer because they didn't um, let people know ahead of time. Well, they that might. This was I, the mean, I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that like um, that that it might have been a, a, a very late last minute decision for in US Soccer might uh, might might have. It might have come into the play at the last minute for them too. I wouldn't discount that. So, so they didn't have anyway. time to get a sort of a uh, statement together, right? Or they, or the, you know, like they, this was something that, that that they didn't know whether or not uh, how certain he was going to be for a call up until, you know, right beforehand. So, you know, it's look they they know they, Zach Steffen's obviously a very big part of uh, Berhalter. He's a he's a player, you know, that's that was his you know Berhalter was his club coach. I'm sure. Yeah, you know, he rates him as high as anybody, but 
it is what it is. You know, it's, um, you know, injuries happen. And sometimes, you know, look, club soccer has to take priority over national team soccer. And, uh, and, and maybe that's what happened here. And, and, and it wouldn't be the first time. And that's just the, the, you know, you don't want to treat every national team game like, like it's like a, like a, a world cup either, because that's just not realistic. And I'm with you though. I think we're in safe hands with Brad Guzan. So it's kind of not worth worrying about. Or Sean Johnson too. I mean, he's, he's, he, he, he's, he's looked apart as well. He can come up with some big stops too. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's not, like I said, it's, I don't, if that's the, the the decisive margin between wins and losses, like um, it's it, it, it shouldn't be, and, and there's other problems there. Final player I want to ask you about on the senior roster um, is the the sort of the source of hope if you're looking for one, um, and it's Serginho Dest because he's you know confirmed on the U.S. men's national team all the way. He's on this roster. I'm really interested in what position what position Serginho Dest plays. I'm assuming he's going to start. What position he plays for Berhalter? against Canada. So it's been left back the two times he's played before. Do you see that being the case again? Yeah, probably. I mean, cause I think, you know, you have Yedlin and Cannon. Um, why would you want to have a third string, you know, right back? Cause I've never seen Yedlin or Cannon uh, do either side. Right. I think those guys have been strictly on the right. So, and then you look at Lovitz has been uh, a couple starts here and there. He's, he's generally been the backup left back to either Dest or Ream. Um, so far this cycle so uh you know you're not going to have like love it start on the left or and then dest and three other two other right backs in back of them or or all of a sudden just start moving oh then you have lima too so you have yeah. five right backs it's kind of strange right? i mean so, so you have so you have so you have five fullbacks on the team and and uh well i mean i guess with that being said he could go either way but um because lima plays left but um i don't know I, i'm kind of thinking that he starts at left back um just because you know, I think the way to get your best eleven on the field um, and the most threatening going forward is to have Yedlin on, you know, Yedlin on the right, and then Dest on the left, and then and then get Cannon some minutes here though too, because you want to be able be able to. I heard the same things as other report. I've heard independently, you know, the same thing as other reports is that he could be eyeing a transfer this winter, and and you want to be able to get him if one of them is England, you want to be able to uh. give him the necessary number of caps, and I think. He gets an automatic work permit if he plays both these games. So maybe he's a late minute sub for both of them. But so you have to kind of think of things like that. And you want to be fair to players and providing them with club opportunities when you can. So, yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, I, I think just looking at the roster, I, maybe they switch in the middle of the game when when they make it when they make a change. But I think Dest is going to come, probably come in here looking as the starting left back. And I'm I'm really interested in if that changes the way Bearhalter plays, right? Because we've seen a lot of Tim Ream at left back, and then he be, sort of becomes a left centre yeah. back in a back three, and Cannon becomes more than just an overlapping right back. He almost goes and occupies like a really high up right wing spot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I personally I liked the idea of it to begin with, but I feel like it's become a little predictable and literally one sided. So I'm I'm sort of optimistic that Dest's inclusion might mean more of a uh, we can attack you up either side with our fullbacks situation. Yeah, I mean, and I'm also wondering if they do if they do the five in the back with two wingbacks. Um, yeah, you know that I think that this roster here with having f- five fullbacks, you know, might might put that in the might might that might make that more of a of a reality than 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 you than you might think. Um, uh, I've also seen just, him do a thing where Will Trapp would come back from centre midfield and sit between two centre backs right, and yeah. form a, a temporary back three. I think that was in one of the friendlies before the Gold Cup, and it didn't go well. But that's definitely no. suggested that's something in Greg Berhalter's head, right? So we might, yeah. See that and again. you don't know, and you'd also don't know if, and you wonder if Greg Berhalter has been thinking over the last couple of weeks, like what I done. You know, I got to, I got to scrap a couple things and come up with different ideas, or yeah. maybe utilize a couple other different ideas and. You know, and, and look what was maybe working. Um, you know, in that first half against Mexico, and uh, and also, you know, like I said, Dest has played on the wing at times for Young Ajax, and Yedlin's played on the wing before. So, you know, the, and, and Lima is too. So there's there's different ways you can use yeah. those guys, and and even Cannon played, I think, in the in, as the right wing in the MLS playoffs against Dallas, where he where he scored a goal. So he did. Yeah. You know, you know, th- these guys are pretty versatile guys and it wouldn't surprise me if they're used as wing backs or wingers um at some point in the game so uh yeah yeah it's it's with the fact that he has five fullbacks on this roster makes it i don't think he's had that before in any of his rosters i really don't um maybe january camp but like this is a this is kind of a first so um 
And actually, uh, looking at the roster now, I see the so obviously Pulisic is not on the named roster. There's you know maybe a fifty fifty chance that we get him, uh, but the listed wingers are Ariola, Tyler Boyd, and I'm going to include Jordan Morris in that. Yeah, Corey Baird essentially got cut right from the. Uh, from well, the he's training been, I mean, he was cut. I think in um, I think he was only included in one of the rosters because there was a uh, Ariola was pulled because of a family emergency. I guess that was a September right. roster. So, you know, those are the, he's a kind of a player that like, like Trap that's kind of seen his role um decrease as well uh but yeah there's there there's a uh, there's limited number of wingers but and a um, surplus of fullbacks which suggests maybe he sees yeah, one of the fullbacks is, as you're starting to think things through where he's like saying okay you know and, and Tyler Boyd you know he, he hasn't you know I know he had the goal last week for or in the Europa League for for Besiktas but you know it hasn't been going his way particularly mm-hmm. well um in recent outings for the US team so uh, you know, there's there's a lot of questions there, and and winger is a position where the team has not been completely uh, settled. Mm-hmm. Let's say, let's put it that way. So, you know, perhaps having some of these fullbacks here um, that could push forward uh, with wingbacks might might um might be an asset for him, uh, and uh, and uh, you know, and particularly also preside maybe have some different de- defensive tactical schemes. Um, you know, to prevent, you know, Canada who can, you know, who has a lot of different really talented attackers right now at the moment. Absolutely. All right. Shall, shall we get to um, the original reason that, uh, sure. that we, we called you up? You you said you're not so optimistic about the men's national team, but you do feel good about this group of uh, U23s. Um, before we get into the details of it, I think I want to start with the basics because I'm really aware that there might be some of our listeners who have no idea that there's a U23 camp getting together or what this U23 camp is all about and what the end goal is. So would you mind giving the sort of the big picture in terms of what's going on with the US under 23s? Well, it's, you know, every four years it's for the Olympics. Um, uh, it's a, it, it, so it's a serious team. And, you know, I've been covering this game for a long time and I've seen pretty much the U23s, when run right and qualifies for the Olympics, offers a magnificent springboard for players to get into that full that full national team. Yeah. Um, you know, I, in 2008, the last time they qualified, you had Stuart Holden, Benny Fielhaber, uh, Maurice Adu, Josie Altador, Michael Bradley. Some of these, all these guys had some caps with the U.S. team before, but then they used that tournament. After that tournament, they were they were like really important parts of the yeah. uh, the national team moving forward. And, I mean, a year later was the Confederations Cup final, right? right? And a lot of them were, were, were then on it too. And and it was it, it's a critical piece of the equation. And 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 it's a big tournament. I mean, look, it's a youth tournament, but you know, and and my buddy Doug McIntyre and I, you know, have written similar things. Uh, they got to prioritize this because this is a chance to you know. This is the second biggest. Well, you can talk. You can dispute the pop the, the the importance of Olympic soccer. Yeah, some European teams don't take it as seriously, but it's taken seriously in South America and and Africa and Asia and parts of Europe too. Like particularly yeah. Eastern Europe, it's growing. And in, in Mexico, for sure, right? I mean, they went Mexico as far as sure winning too. it. So this gives you a chance to uh, and more eyes in this country are watching you. Like all of a sudden, if you have a good Olympics and you you, you make it to the semifinals like they did in 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 like 2000, which is attainable, then all of a sudden, like you have momentum with this program, positive yeah. headlines for the first time you've had since I would say 2016, when they had a semifinal run to the Copa America here. Um, that's it. So, you know, it, it buys it, it, CONCACAF, CONCACAF results really only have a limited shelf life. They, they really do. Like you, you can win the gold cup, but it doesn't, the Olympics is what gathers, what, what, what galvanizes people. And, um, and this generation is big. So, Anyway, they're in their fifth camp of the cycle. They they qualifying is very hard out of Concacaf too because only two teams make it as opposed to your typical four for U twenty or U seventeen World Cup. So yep. there's no margin for error, and um, and of course it's being a youth tournament. Clubs never have to release players um, for youth youth national teams ever. So they you know it, but. You know, they've been willing to so far um, for Jason Christ. And when I talk to the players, they're having a positive experience in these camps. Um, and so, the, you know, this is going to be their biggest test to date. They're in uh, Spain and they're going to be playing Brazil. And then depending on the win or loss from the other semifinal game, you it's a pretty much semifinal product. And then if you go to the third place game, it'll be the uh, the loser of Argentina or Chile, or it'll be the winner of those two if you go to the the championship game. So those are very big opponents right now, and it should 
be a big, big test for this U23 team. And um, and everyone except for James Sands has been called up to this U23 team before. So you're starting to see a core emerge for uh, Jason Kreis. And, um, and, uh, and you know, eventually, I think, I think we talked about him before, but I think guys like Reggie Cannon and Jackson Yule will drop down. And then the money question, though, is like, what do you do with the, the stars? Um, Pulisic, McKenney. Dest, Sargent, Adams, like, do they ever come in at any point? And um, yeah, everyone thinks that maybe uh, the U.S. soccer can negotiate the release for a couple of these guys if they qualify for the Olympics. Um, you know, that's probably this, you know, I, I think it's unrealistic to think they'll get all of them, but I think they'll get a few of them if they get to the Olympics. So you'll see some stars on hand if they get to if they get to uh, Tokyo. And uh, but for qualifying, it's probably going to be mostly these guys. Yeah, so speaking of getting to the Olympics, that's what we failed to do in 2012 and in 2016. The the CONCACAF Olympic qualifying tournament is, I want to say, late March 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Is it going to be where that's not an official FIFA international date and uh, we'll have trouble getting players called up or will will that be easier? Because well, I've, heard, I've heard some people ask, like, maybe, maybe if we really take this seriously, maybe this is a tournament where we, we call up Christian Pulisic and ask him to play for the U23s and finally get us qualified. Well, those guys all want to do it. Tim Way is another one. I mean, remember, he didn't want to play for the U.S. national team. He wanted to play for the U20 World yeah. Cup. So there, there's a guy, you know, you kind of see where his heart's in um, when it comes to these things. But listen, it doesn't matter if it's on an international window or not, because uh, you, they're, even in, during an international window, clubs are never required to release players for youth games. Now oh, I see. So because now, it's got because it's but, got U twenty three in it. International window, they might be more inclined to do so, but they're never required. So you know that take that for what you will. Like some clubs might might you know might be make it more difficult, saying yeah, only the senior national team, but we don't want them to go to play some youth tournament in Mexico. Like they they might feel that way. So, so it's, in, it's in Guadalajara, right? The uh, yeah, it the is. Qualifying and, tournament. and another issue though to think about too, and I don't know the answer to this, and I don't think this has been. This has been um, fully determined yet. Uh, if it has been, it hasn't been released to the public. But uh, there's, such, there's, some, there's a concept called ros- roster augmentation. Now, they did this in the U-20s for their qualifying for the U-20 World Cup, where during the international window, they allowed teams to make, I think it was up to six roster changes during the international window, so that that allowed Tab Ramos to bring in Serginho Dest and Chris Richards. And, uh, you know, clubs were required, you know, but those players were at the youth levels with their 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 clubs i mean i know chris richards is still there but he was able to bring in some some bigger talent for um uh for you know u20 world cup qualifying and so is this um, like between the group stage and the knockout round you yeah can it might be your yeah, whatever whenever it falls during that march international window if if the big not you know, remember it, it, typically this tournament happens in the fact that like you go through group stages then you get then you go to the quarterfinals and then, uh, and then you have to win your quarterfinal game. And then you go to a must-win semifinal game, uh, and if you win that, you know, then you go to the Olympics. That's typically been the format in the past. Yeah. So you know, maybe there's a way that they could negotiate like the release in 2008. What's interesting is John Jonathan Spector, I think, was in West Ham at the time. He'd left Man United, but but he was starting in the Premier League, and and they worked out a deal where Jonathan Spector could play for the U23s in that one important knockout game. And then they wouldn't call him up for uh, some other full national team game. That he was a he was an important player of the team at that point, but he was U twenty three eligible. So they've made deals like that in the past. Um, I mean, look, I, if it was up to me, if I was running the show, I'd do whatever I could to uh, start talking with clubs now, and you know, because the full national team is only playing friendlies in March, and see what is possible depending on the dates of the tournament um, to send the best possible squad and drag the team into Tokyo and then work on releases there because um, that's, what's going to get the team, the, the Federation, some good PR. That's, what's going to get it, you know, some good experience and, and good Olympics, man. Let me tell you like that. I mean, I remember 2000, that was, that was Josh Wolf and Landon Donovan and um, uh, John O'Brien. All of a sudden they took big roles with the national team and they were part of the 2002 squad. And, 2008, like I mentioned, it was those other guys like Adu. And I mean, it, it's a tournament that U.S. soccer wants to be part of. They don't have the European championships. There's limited time you can send your best players or a very good squad to play uh, non uh, CONCACAF opponents anymore. It's a very much a challenge now that the Confederations Cup scrapped and, yeah. and Copa America tournaments are not necessarily guaranteed or, you know, you know it, that becomes an issue of itself playing in those. So anytime you get a chance to play against non 
CONCACAF opponents in a, in a very serious tournament where that a lot of Americans are going to be watching and you can get a good chunk of good, good part of your core team together. I think they have to take advantage of it. And, you know, it, it's like the U.S. could go out and win the Nations League, but that wouldn't, that wouldn't generate a fraction of the good the, the, of the benefits of doing well in the Olympics would do. Um, so what it's about, just even if they, how I feel. Even if um, maybe only one or two of the sort of star names are available yeah. for the actual qualifying tournament. That's um, enough. Do, yeah. do I take it from what you've said, though, that the, the current squad, the, you know, the, the players that are in camp now with the U23s, with Jason Christ, going to this tournament in Spain, do you think that current sort of roster of players is good enough to, to qualify? I think so. Um, you know, you have to look at it like this. Um, uh, the, the Every U23 cycle, let me put it this way, is built off of the last two U20 um, okay. w- cycles. So this is essentially the birth year cutoff is 1997, which would have been the 2017 World Cup and the 2019 U20 World Cup. So, And we made quarterfinals both times, right? We made quarterfinals both times, but but even more so, both those teams were the first two U20 teams to ever win CONCACAF. Uh-huh. So so you're looking at like um, two teams that are built off of U20 teams that won CONCACAF. Now, granted, like some of those players are now, uh, you know, in situations like Tyler Adams where he might not be released um, or, you know, Alex Mendez, although he probably will be released. You know, it's, it, it's Serginho Dest was on the last team. So it's tough, but. You know, I you like where this team stands in terms of getting playoff, uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, where it's stood in CONCACAF throughout its experience in previous youth national team cycles. And on top of it, too, the, the last two U20 teams were also built what I wrote about the missing years generation, which was yeah. a bunch of birth years that just didn't work out. And the, those U20 teams, you know, sorry, U23 teams that were trying to qualify were the height of those years. And if you look at them now, like there's a lot of players on the last U23 team that aren't even part of um they're a lot of them are, they're playing at low levels usl or sometimes some of them are even out of the games and yeah. look the u23 needs to be a higher standard than u20s i mean this should be guys who are almost on the verge of uh making the national team and yeah, instead I, I we, remember, were going, we were going to Concacaf with squads that were almost on the verge of falling out of the game so yeah i remember pinning a lot of my hopes on jerome kisaveta yeah, I mean, where is he? He's a El Paso locomotive, I think. Last time I heard, you know, and Will Packwood is out of the game. You know, it's just, it's, um, you know, it's. Uh, you look back at those rosters and and you just think like, wow, it, a lot went wrong for U.S. soccer in those U class two U twenty three cycles. You have to feel a little bit better now. I mean, a lot of these guys are, you know, playing regularly. They're, they're coming off seasons where they played twenty five hundred minutes, thirty, yeah, you know, pushing three hundred three thousand minutes. Um, look, but still, it's a tough gig to qualify for because there's such a low margin for error. Um, you know, two teams qualify at a CONCACAF. The last two teams, U.S. and Mexico always go into this as the favorites to qualify. And the U.S. and Mexico haven't qualified automatically, uh, Not, I mean, qualified you know, via qualification, not including host nation berths like in 96. It hasn't been the U.S. and Mexico to represent CONCACAF since 92, I think it was. So it is um, – it's a, it's a very tough team. There's always like a favorite that, that gets knocked out somewhere along the lines. There's, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a very tough tournament to qualify. I like the team's chances more than the last two, but, you know, it's, it's by no means a slam dunk. Is it, um, is it a younger roster than the last couple of times? I'm looking at guys like Ledesma and, and Mendez yeah. um, and even Chris Richards. I feel like there's more teenagers than yeah, like, I mean, 21, 22-year-olds. Yeah, there are there are some um, like you have to remember that uh, uh, you know guys like Cannon and Yule I think will come down um, right uh, and, and then you have the then you have the star generations I mean it used to be like we you would try to qualify with our best hand I mean now we're still trying the U.S. team is trying to qualify with one hand tied behind its back uh, without like your top guys there but that's how it is and um, you know it's it's uh, it, it is a young roster you would usually want. As like I mentioned, you have the two U twenty cycles. Usually, you want the the older one, which would be the twenty seventeen cycle, to be the one leading the way. Right. Um, and uh, that's the older cycle. And uh, they are. I think you have a good defense defensive group here. I think with Cameron Carter Vickers and Anthony Robinson, and you know when, when Cannon comes down, I mean, 
you're dealing with a bunch of guys who all have at least 6,000 professional minutes along your back line. That's, that's outstanding. Is that better than um, last time? Yeah, I think so. Cause you, know, you went with Miazga who was playing with the Red Bulls. He was doing okay. Vickers was, was never, was, wasn't, wasn't a professional at Boyd Okwonu. Uh, Dylan Cerno was playing at a left back. Um, oh, you wow. know, it was, there, there was a lot of, you know, the back line is, is more, far more experienced. They're more experienced up and down the roster. Um, so it seems like there's a mix of guys with real professional experience, like right. CCV and Anthony Robinson, and then guys with maybe bigger promise than we've ever seen from a generation of US players, like Chris Richards at Bayern and Alex Mendez at Ajax. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, you have those guys, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if, if one of them gets cut. I think Ledesma's in a better position right now. Um uh, but then, cause then you also have like, like I said, you know, you, you go through that list of, of, of guys like Christian Kappas is playing well yeah. and he's playing first team minutes. And what I also like too is Hassani Dodson. I know I mentioned him earlier, but yeah, yeah. Guy, what, what do you I, like I believe, about him? Well, I mean, for example, he's the guy that he is, plays the role that the U S is thin in right now. It's a defensive midfield position. And, you know, he had a great rookie year. I mean, he—I think he surprised Minnesota because he had Jan Grigas and Ozzy Alonso there in the defensive midfield positions. But like, he still earned a lot of time, and and I think he makes one of those guys not you know more expendable. And and he's a guy that they're going to want to get on the field because he also he plays the six. He can get forward um, in an attacking position, so he kind of gives the U.S. Uh, U twenty threes an advantage that the senior team doesn't have right now without Tyler Adams because they, you know then now they have more you have that experienced back line but now you also have a defensive midfielder that can cover a lot of ground and remember he also plays left and right back um as a as a backup position which is also big because if you go to the Olympics it's an 18 player roster I so you have to think about, about that. that you have yeah. to build your rosters differently because it's the smallest roster for any FIFA event so you want um, utility guys you need you need everyone needs to be able to play two or three positions, particularly the backups. And obviously, so I think he's got to you know if they brought Tyler Adams, he's a great backup for him. But anyway, so you have a guy who can cover a lot of ground. He's fast and 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 so yeah, you have a real six in this program. So they can play you know a way that the senior team can't right now um, uh, by virtue of having uh, some real roles filled. Uh, it, it's um, so. You know, like like I said, it's by no means is it sure, but you're dealing with guys who are real professionals right now um, uh, versus guys who are just kind of only starting to break in, uh, you know, four years ago. So we haven't been able to see much of this U23 team, right? Like the games don't seem to be televised. Yeah, I'll, they've I'll be been, looking I mean, for streams, intentionally, but... they've, been, they've only been, um, you know, they've only posted highlights, but they've been close to the media and close to fans. Um uh, you know, it doesn't stop you from talking to players afterwards and, you know, you know, on the record, off the record, finding out what's going on and, um, yeah. and, uh, and getting things. I mean, look, they, they had a very nice effort against Japan, um, you know, a two nothing win there, uh, you know, and, uh, and a lot of guys have been playing well and guys that maybe you wouldn't expect like that. That's how Brendan Aronson, I think that played a big role in the fact that he got called up to the full national team. Same with Pomica, right? I heard that they yeah, were well, Pomica Pomica. hasn't played for this team yet. Oh, he that's interesting. Played- has he, yeah, yeah, has he been he in, out of the, he, has he he been in the camp? first half of the excuse me? Has he been in a U23 camp? I thought I heard that he No, 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 because camp. he had the U20 World Cup. He wasn't there in September because he was the full national team. And then no none of the Dallas players were released for oh, yes. the October U23 camp because um uh, uh they you know they, the Dallas was preparing for the playoffs. Okay. Um you know, uh which is also interesting because I think Cervania was probably one of the bigger noteworthy absences on the team um so far. Uh but uh, you know, like I said, I like um, I like the roster balance. You know, they have some wingers there uh, that have been doing well. They have some, you know, some some center forwards. So they, you know, they seem to have players who are, um, you know, well experienced for this age group. You know, but again, you know, it's so tough to say like you feel too good about this this um, this team because there's the qualification is is such a slippery slope in terms of there's no margin for error on it. One one big question I have. Um, so, uh, like like me, you haven't been able to see much footage, right, of this team in action. Right. But you have been talking to players and people around the team. Do you have a sense of the style of play, like the the shape and the system this team's going with? Like, is it like similar to what Berhalter's is doing? Is it a whole different thing that Jason Christ is doing, or is it somewhere in between? Like, how how are they setting up? How are they trying to play? Well, I mean, I think that it's it's a little bit similar, but you know, it's a little bit more direct as well. Um... You know, I can't speak. Uh, you know, it's so t- it's you know, you never want to make definitive statements like that based on, yeah. um, uh, you know, how much they they, uh, um, 
you know, based on not having seen it yourself. Uh, but you know, like I said, I think that they're helped with, like I mentioned before, is they have players who are, they're, they're not, ha- they don't have to shoehorn players into these roles. Um, right. you know, they have, they have guys who are playing the positions that are asked them probably a little bit more naturally. Like I said, they have that number six who's, who, who's defensively physical. They have a bunch of number eights. They also have like with Ledesma, they have like a real number 10. So mm-hmm. whereas I was saying with the senior team, you look at every one of those midfielders, every single one of them on the team, on the, on the, on the U S team. That's not a winger, but like every single one of those central base midfielder, they're all number eights, quasi number eights. And then you have to kind of divvy up the positions amount. The the 23s, I think, is better um, right now because you have your eights, uh, you have your sixes, you have your you have your tens. Yes, you do have a couple guys who do the generic overlap, but there's the positions are a little bit more properly defined. And and you look at your central defenders, like I was saying per you know when you go up against another u23 team you you have guys who are very experienced um coming off a couple of 2000 minute seasons like vickers and robinson and um you know even herrera is a backup you know i yeah. think he'll be a backup not backup right back but to reggie cannon but like these are all guys who are who are playing regularly the big worry i think i think is is goalkeeping um you know, yeah, Matt Freeze, Masikowski, like, and Scott. Are the Freeze three. is number one right now. He looks like he's getting the starts in in, in all the important friendlies. Um, but still, you know, a couple of appearances for Philadelphia. Um, you know, it, it's it's not like when they had uh, four years ago when they had Stefan out there and Horvath and yeah. guys who were you know uh, it, it's 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 you wish it was a little bit better. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where if they qualify, it's going to be a, a, one of those three overagers is almost certainly going to go to um, like uh, a, like a guy like Sean, like preferably Zach Steffen, maybe Sean Johnson, one of those kind of caliber goalkeepers. So you kind of famously coined the term "missing generation," I think accurately for for what's been going on in the last few years. Mm-hmm. Are you more optimistic that this might be like the found generation, like when suddenly we we have um, a sort of breadth and depth of talent that that we should have? Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and think about this, though, you know, you don't want to put that basis of the fact that the talent is there and then stick it, you know, have it be staked on national team results. Like right. you can have a talented national team and this doesn't get the results because, you know, for whatever reason, they're not a good fit together or the coaching isn't there or the system's not there, you know, and uh, or there's a coaching change and it doesn't doesn't jive. You know, there, there's all different things that could. Um, right. So you're saying that can, that. that can be true but, regardless of results, right? But yeah, that could be true regardless of results. But you know, you look at the younger generation; they're 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 playing at big clubs, and even in MLS, they're more um, they're more difference makers. Uh, you know, you have like Brendan Aronson was the starting number ten for uh, you know a team that finished third in the East, and uh, you know, and Paxton Palmer call you know helped played hurt the second half of the year, and and, and was helped helped drag Dallas across the finish line to get into the playoffs. Like you're starting to see guys who are not just like when you look back on four years. In the missing years, you had guys like Fatai Alash, who was, mm-hmm. you know, a, a part-time starter for I think it was San Jose at the time, or um, you know, Dylan Serna didn't really play all that much. Miazga was good, but he was on the very he was on the younger side. Um, you know, there was still a lot of um, you know guys who just you know they had a you know uh, Alonzo Hernandez, Gabolio Oribe, There's a, a, a Mackie Tall. There's just a bunch of guys who just well, I'm having you know, flashbacks. Jose Villarreal. I'm having flashbacks like, these, as you're reading these names. Out. Yeah, Jose Villarreal. Like these guys just. Did, I mean, you feel like these guys, even if they, you know, the worst they're going to do is have a nice professional career if they're not full national team players, and and that's that's a pretty good level to be at. So, you know, you see the 17s. Um, you realize that birth bad birth years like the 2002s from that class, you know, are possible. You don't want to dismiss the whole 2002s yet, but you, know, you have to dial youth national team results matter, and they and they yeah. And, and, and they and they show that like you know if you look one bad youth youth national team at a, a, a one bad cycle for a youth national team whether it be the 17s or the 20s isn't the end of the world but you start getting a bunch of them all bunched up together um, it could be a, a real bad scenario for uh, it could point to like a major uh, problems down the road for the full national team. Uh, so you, put it that way. I think you didn't name it specifically, but were you referring to the recent U17 World Cup, the US? Right. Yeah. The 2002s. To get out of the group. That was yeah. built on the 2002s. And, you know, and, and um, you know, you have to kind of like say, okay, well, how are the 2003s? How are the 2001s? Yeah. You know, you don't want to, you have to start looking at the, you know, because the 2002s, you know, didn't pass a, an important test. 
Um, I mean, that's that doesn't really apply to the to the 2003s as we know them uh, or the 20, U23s as we know them, because um, that's a that's a much older group. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I mean, isn't look, it, is know, it look, fair to say that this is like the the Tab Ramos generation, right? There's a lot of these players played in U20 World Cups for, for yeah, Tab I mean, Ramos. It, 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 that, that's fair, although some of them skipped it. Um, right. Like Pulisic and McKenney, although they were identified by Tab, he just couldn't get them. Oh, no, um, the, the U23s I'm talking about, this current U23 oh, roster. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I look well, at a lot yeah, of these guys I mean, played for Tab. Well, there's some guys who Tab had in camp and, and, he, and he cut, but they're still <laughs> right. big parts of the team, like Mihailovic and Cannon and Yule. And, I mean, those are guys who didn't, you know, who Tab identified and, and, and for whatever reason passed on all of them. I mean, but he always says, Tab tells me every single cycle, like, some of the guys I cut are going to be some of the best guys in, in this age group. It's just right. how it, you know how it is, but it's the test of the overall generation. You know, the, if the if the if the team he selects it does well, the teams the players we cuts are going to also do well. It's a it's a it's a you know you have to look at it kind of like big picture like that. Um, so, if, but yeah, it's uh, kind of like the Tab generation, Tab Ramos generation. I think it's fair. <laughs> I mean, the youth national teams, not just his team, but the seventeens also did well for the most part while he was the U twenty coach and. Yeah. Um, you know, and and it's a credit to uh, to not just the, he benefited from a from an improving generation of players, but he also uh, did really well with them too. And they like playing with each other. The best thing Tab did, you know, he doesn't develop players. And the youth national team coaches don't generation don't generate don't develop players. The best thing Tab did, and and the, and the enduring legacy he will have is that he bred an enthusiasm for playing for the United States in yep. all of those kids. Like they played hard. Even the players that were left out, you know, wanted to get back in the thing because they liked playing for this, for the team under him. Like, like it was a, it was never a chore for these players. It's something that they, they, they it would became a, re- a core part of their identity. And, um, hence the Sergio uh, Des decision, right? He definitely um, yeah, was think, influenced yeah, by his Hackworth time. Attack. Too. And, and Hackworth, I think did a very good job with him too. Um, you, you know, at the seventeens. But, you know, you look at, like, decisions like Tim Weah. He wanted to come back and play for the U-20s. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it's the, it's the it, you know, it, you know, Tabby's moved on to bigger and things where he's now going to develop players on a club. And that's very exciting to see him do that. So it's a step up for him. Um, he can now stake his, you know, stake a claim in developing players, not just organizing them, which is what youth national teams do. But as the youth national team, uh, U-20 head coach and the technical direct, youth technical director while he was there, the players just had this, you know, an enthusiasm for playing for for the for the for the U.S. that I haven't seen at the youth levels ever. Um, bigger you know, picture, so was are, are great. You, bigger picture, are you worried about the sort of current like lack of um, lack of jobs filled at the youth level? Yeah, have I, mean, I, think Vicky? A, I think it's a problem. I think it's gone on too long because um, you know you, you start you, you want to have players. It's not so much. Look, it's not going to harm their development because, like I said, that's that's all at the club level. Like you right. don't you know, national teams, youth national teams, don't assemble enough for coaches to develop the players. But what it does is is you want players in that regular routine of playing for the for for the for the national team because that's what makes them want to go back and having positive experiences. It builds the camaraderie among players of that generation and um, and the excitement. And you want them to always have that. You know, so if you want them to be playing for the U18s or the U19s or, or uh, the U20s, on a, you don't want like an international window to go by. I know like the 20s aren't in session right now, but like that's too bad because. You want like then you want because this U twenty team is the two thousand ones you and they're pretty good and you want them to be playing like your Uli Lanes is and and, yeah. and other players you want them to be uh, in camp right now and having good experiences and and that's what it's all about and I think that's where Tab was was a home run of a hire and and and, and a map and a huge asset to U.S. soccer is is it's more than not, it's not so much your tactics or. Or, or your style or anything it's 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 how much do you how much do you make this a positive experience for the players to want to really motivate them to to uh to win for that crest and and win for each other and and it's the bond that the players have amongst each other that's so important and um and uh yeah you know uh you, you got to think these 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 things will be will be filled soon uh these jobs i mean because there's, there's up vacancies up, and a lot of positive thought will go into like filling these venues you know not just you don't want tacticians you want guys who are going to really you know breed that love like tab did and and you know, and he had such a good thing with omid and yeah. hackworth and himself so yeah I, I agree it's been a problem in, in in that regard do you do you have any read on why like 
Tab's guys weren't kept around. Guys like Omid, why, why isn't he still part of the staff? It, was it a thing of like um, Ernie Stewart sort of cleaning house and getting rid of all the yeah, all the tab I mean, guys? It might be. I mean, you know, every new, every new, you know, there's a lot of new power, powerful people coming into U.S. soccer on the soccer things, and I'm sure that they want to have their own hand in things. I can't speak for that, but you know, they, they you know, it, it, Omid, who was very good with the U 2001s. Um, I mean, I don't think he lost a game with the U- U18s. Uh, uh, you know, he, he took the job in Iran, I think, um, for that club team. It didn't really work out. And then I, I think, you know, he had a tough time getting back in after that when, when um, you know, those are tough jobs to take over there you know, in terms of getting paid regularly. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and look, no, Omid's now working for Tab um, as his assistant. Uh, so, oh, I forgot that. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, so, 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 you know, I mean, Omid Namazi. Uh, I just realized we haven't said his second name, but yeah, Omid yeah, Namazi. Omid Namazi, and 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 you know, and and, and that's kind of interesting too, because Omid, I think, likes to develop players. But I mean, he he would have been an ideal uh, guy for the U twenties because you know he knows that group. But uh, in the end of the day, it's going to be up to Ernie and and Greg making these kind of decisions now. And and if Wiki um, sticks around, or if the U seventeens was was such a poor performance that they want to look elsewhere, I, you know, who knows? Uh, I know that they they you know. That was Greg's decision to hire him, but I mean, he had a great resume. I supported it at the time, but it's uh, you know, it, it obviously was a was a frustrating performance at the 17s World Cup. So, yeah, they have a lot of things to think about, like right now, and uh, and you got to think that they're gonna that might you know hiring these youth national team coaches is gonna be the first thing that they do after this November window, um, because I, so. I mean, it's the start of the cycle essentially. Oh, so they pretty much have to hire people, right? The 20s. Yeah, so they've got to hire people because there's there's work yeah they got to hire people, and then you know they they were doing really good work um on when Tab was there, you know, with the U 19s and the U 18s because they had a real pipeline, and Sean Sakaris was uh was I think at the 16s, so they really had a real good pipeline up, and they and they all you know worked very well with each other, moving players up and down teams who were eligible for multiple age groups you know, finding right spots for them to, you know, and, and it was really a good pipeline. And, and I think that's really what helped the youth national teams, um, so well, you know, they, they've gotten great results for the most part, um, until the last 17s world cup, um, they've been doing well and, you know, you want, you you know, and you, you hope that, that that's kind of in mind for the next, um, round of hires, but look, at the same time, to be fair to U.S. soccer, no one really stays in, in youth national team gigs too, too long. I mean, it's a stepping stone. It's not something I think anyone really wants to be married to. I think everyone, um, you know, if they could ever move up to an MLS head coaching job is is, is clearly a, a better thing because yeah. you want to, I mean, most coaches want to be working with players on a daily basis, not like a week here, then a couple of months later, a week there. That's, that's you know, it, it's, a, it's always going to be, you know, someone look, I mean, that's why Hackworth went to Indy 11. Um, uh, so, you know, you always have to spend, expect a lot of turnover, but the same point too, is you don't want them to go this long without filling them. Okay. So I'll be, um, I'll be patiently watching or maybe impatiently (laughs) watching for, um, for us soccer announcements about new coaching hires. Um, if people want to sort of follow the progress of this U23 team, um, in Spain, and then as we get closer to Olympic qualifying in March, I would say one of the best ways is to, to read Brian's stuff at americansoccernow.com. Um, are you publishing anywhere else, Brian? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be uh, hopefully doing something with, uh, uh, some U23 coverage for soccer America as well. All right. Um, you know, like we, 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 you know, a lot of those old public, you know, that was an older publication, but it's one that really gets the importance of this U23 team too, and and sees how critical it is into the big picture. Um, uh, so, I'm happy to help help them out as well, and uh, and obviously I'll be on Twitter a lot as you know as I regularly am. All right, I'll put a link to your Twitter profile um, in the <laughs> uh, in the show notes just to make sure people can find you. Because it sounds like that's the best way to. Get like yeah, almost real a portal into real all time, year. Um, you know, uh, you know, insight as to how these games become available, or as as I be, as I get news from camp and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll put it up on Twitter, and I'll try to have uh, regular updates as I get them on, on on American Soccer now. All right, that's great. And then, oh, final thing: Am I right in thinking that the actual Olympic qualifying tournament is usually televised? I feel like I have a memory of watching these games on like NBC. I have, have nightmares watching them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we all remember Sean Johnson coughing up that one goal in uh, in, in Nashville. I was there, and and then um, and then uh, losing to Honduras, and and I think it was uh, Kansas City. Right? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. So, or it, it's um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, they usually are televised. Um, so I, I would expect the same as well. So watch if you dare. Watch if you dare. <laughs> well, yeah, we still have several more months. So, so uh, yes. All right, Brian, thank you so much for taking all the time. We've been talking for nearly an hour. It's absolutely flown by on my end. I hope it, hope it hasn't gone slowly for you. No, anytime you want me on, please let me know. All right, thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.